Chapter 92 The Altar Exodus chapter 27 Verses 1 to 8 And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans, all the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. And thou shalt make for it a grate of network of brass, and upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with boards shall thou make it, as it was showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. Exodus chapter 27 verses 1 to 8 In these verses, the directions are given for the construction of the altar for sacrifice. These directions are restated in Exodus chapter 38 verses 1 to 7 when we were told of its construction. There was to be a wooden understructure of acacia wood, heavily overlaid with bronze and with a grating above. There were to be pointed projections at the four corners. All previous altars in Israel had been temporary ones. Now the altar was to be the abiding centre for Israel in its worship. The altar stood between the people and the Holy of Holies, or the presence of God. Previous altars had been of earth or unhewn stones. Man could not be the builder of an altar until God himself ordained it and gave these specific directions for its construction. H. L. Ellison estimated the dimensions of the altar as seven and one half feet square and four and one half feet high. The projections or horns of the altar were what a man seeking sanctuary caught hold of. Exodus chapter 21 verse 14, 1 Kings chapter 2 verse 28. The description of the tabernacle's interior begins with the Holy of Holies and moves outward to a degree, but this is not entirely so, in that some variation exists in terms of importance, that is, the altar of sacrifice before the altar of incense. The blood of sacrificed animals was placed on part of the horns of the altar. Thus, the man seeking sanctuary did so in terms of the atonement and the law of the atoner. Some scholars believe that the area between the bronze and the acacia wood was packed with earth to absorb the heat. Verse 5 points out that the altar was hollow, and some rabbis said that, when the altar was not moved, the hollow area was earth-filled. The reference in verses 4 and 5 to a network and nets means a grill to allow the circulation of air to facilitate burning on the grate. This altar stood at the entrance of the outer court. Before one could go to the laver or to the holy place, one had to stand before the altar of sacrifice. There is no approach to God without atonement. In no culture or society has there ever been free and unrestricted access to royalty or to rulers. Such access would destroy all ability to rule because it would mean that authorities would be deluged with endless details and trivia. In no modern corporation or branch of civil governments does such unrestricted access to the persons in authority exist. There is, however, 
a very strong belief on the part of many that such access should exist. At times, some men have tried briefly to institute such an open-door policy. Moses, after the Red Sea crossing, attempted to provide this kind of access. His father-in-law Jethro rebuked Moses graciously, saying, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee, thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Exodus chapter 18, verses 17 and 18. Jethro urged the adoption of a series of graded courts to cope with Israel's problems and the system of elders for every ten families, going on up to the seventy elders, was instituted. Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 to 26. This step was confirmed by God. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 11 to 18. This plan was applied in Israel to the various areas of government, including civil, family and other spheres. It became the pattern of both synagogue and church government. The term elder is still used within the church, but it is within the church that the pattern is least applied. The elders in a church usually sit in judgment on the pastor and members, a function limited to emergencies and serious moral or theological delinquencies. The normal function of elders is pastoral. They are to hear the problems of the families in their care. One elder in every ten families, and if they cannot resolve the problem, it can be referred on up to the pastor by the elders or the persons involved. Unrestricted access to the pastor is wearing out many clergymen. In brief, mediation is a fact of life. In every sphere of society, we have persons who mediate between a higher authority and those under them. The function of the altar is mediation. God, however, being omnipotent and omniscient, knows all things, and mediation in this sense is not necessary. The fact that necessitates mediation between God and man is man's outlaw status. Man is fallen, he is a sinner and is under sentence of death according to God's law. He thus needs urgently and radically a mediator who can have access to the throne of God. George Bush wrote, Taking it for granted that the idea of mediatorship is fundamental in the typical institution of the altar, we are naturally led to investigate the point of analogy in this respect between the shadow and the substance. Now, it is obvious that one of the leading offices of a mediator is the procurement of peace or the recognition of offended and contending parties and we have the decided evidence of heathen antiquity in favour of connecting the effect with the symbolic uses of altars. An act of expiation leads to peace and reconciliation. Thus, we have two acts inseparably tied to the altar. First, a mediatorship that brings peace and reconciliation, because the altar is the place of expiation. Second, because there is this reconciliation, there is a celebration of it by eating, by breaking bread together. This means the Passover and other feasts, and in the church, communion. There is, however, a third aspect to the altar. The horns afford protection to the person who is innocent and is pursued by an avenger. The altar is the defence of the helpless and the weak. Hence the deacon's offering and ministry to the needy is inseparable from the Lord's table. Both the altar and the sacrifice clearly point to Jesus Christ, who is our mediator and our sacrifice. The altar was, in the first section of the sanctuary, an outer court, and only the covenant people had access to it. The second section, the holy place, 
only the priesthood could enter. The third was the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could enter, and that but once a year. This altar was unlike all other known altars in the horns or projections at its four corners. The access to the altar by the unjustly oppressed meant that the royal palace was a place of mercy, not only because of the sacrifices, but also because of the sanctuary or refuge it provided. The altar at the entrance to the sanctuary meant that sin must be atoned for in order for one to have access to God. The horns provided sanctuary for the covenant people who were unjustly accused. The altar thus represented the need for atonement to satisfy man's justice and a sanctuary against man's injustice. George Rawlinson wrote on the purpose of the altar, We have assumed throughout that the purpose of the altar, its main purpose, was expiation. Its proper title was the altar of burnt offering. All offerings except those which the high priest offered at the altar of incense in the Holy of Holies were to be made at this brazen altar before the door of the tabernacle. Hither were the Israelites to bring alike their peace or thank offerings, their burnt offerings and their sin offerings. Expiation was the sole idea of the last of these, and a main idea of the second. It was absent only from the first. Thus, it was the predominant idea of sacrifice. The altar witnessed to the guilt of man in God's sight, and the need of an atonement being made for him before he could be reconciled to the High and Holy One. It witnessed also to God's eternal purpose, that a way of reconciliation should be devised and made known to man. The true victim was not indeed as yet offered. Bulls and goats, lambs and rams could never of themselves or of their own proper force sanctify the unclean or take away sin. It was only by virtue of the death which their sacrifice prefigured that they had any atoning force or could be accepted by God as expiatory. Each victim represented Christ, the one and only sacrifice for sin which could propitiate the Father, and the altar therefore represented and typified the cross on which Christ died, offering himself thereon to the Father, as both priest and victim. Ship and material were different, and the mode of death was different, but each was the material substance on which the atoning victim died, each was stained with the atoning blood, and each was unspeakably precious to the trembling penitent who felt his need of pardon, and if possible, even more precious to him who knew that atonement had thereon been made for him and felt his pardon sealed. No true Israelite would sacrifice on any altar but that of the sanctuary. No true Christian will look for pardon and atonement anywhere but to the cross of Christ, and to him who on that altar gave his life for man. It is a fact of interest that the early church took the Bible so seriously that its reproduction of the tabernacle's furnishings was at times very literal. Portable altars were common in many churches, made very much as Exodus chapter 27 verses 1 to 8 stipulates, but with some differences. They were made of wood until late in the 8th century, but of other materials, including stone in later centuries, and still portable. The portable altar continued in the Ethiopian church.